my goal, obviously, today was to have the most buzzwordy title of this conference. Um, you'll, uh, you'll let me know at the end of the day uh, how well I did. Um, the, it, it, you might have, if you're in the field of machine learning right now, you might have seen that there's a little, a little bit of a craze going on, uh, a little bit of a cargo cult. Uh, everybody's talking about generative adversarial networks. Uh, there's a ton of work going on in generative adversarial networks of different flavors. There is a new model for generative adversarial networks, GANs, uh, coming up pretty much every day. And um, on the face of it, it's a little strange, right? Because this is a generative model. The goal is to generate nice looking images uh, from data. And it's, it's you know, relatively narrow scope of uh, interest. It's a little complicated little machine, and I'll describe it later, but it, it, you know, on the face of it, it's, it's a little complex, it's hard to train. Um, it, it's almost as bad as deep reinforcement learning. No, I shouldn't be saying that to that audience, maybe. Um, so, but there's something to it. There's something really interesting, actually. So just to set the stage, um, generative adversarial networks are these things where the goal is to, as I said, to generate uh, images. And so you have some random variables uh, or, or um, a hidden states that's uh, not unstructured, that doesn't correspond to anything, and you're trying to generate from it uh, an image using a generator, which is a trained neural network, typically. And the way you do this is by, um, you have a large data set of natural images, for example, things that you want to be generating uh, samples from, and you're going to sample from this real data, and you're going to be sampling from your generative network, and you're going to be trying to determine um, whether the data that you've uh, sampled is real data or fake data. And that's gonna be the job of another network called the discriminator that's trying to uh, discriminate between the two. And the key fact here is that you train and the generator and the discriminator, you co-train them in, 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 in tandem. You're trying to pit them against each other and uh, they learn from each other um, in, um, in, in tandem. So what's interesting about this is that it really inspired two area, lines of research that they're not necessarily new per se, but they've sort of gotten a, a bit of a revival. Uh, one is conditional image generation. So the idea of being able to generate an image based on a, uh, a, a, a hidden feature input. And the second one is about thinking adversarially uh, when you're trying to pose a, a problem. So let's talk about the generation part. And the really interesting aspect here is that we can now generate realistic images that are pretty darn good. So that this is an example of uh, one of the many flavors of GANs trying to generate uh, face images, and they're entirely synthetic. They, they don't, cl they're not close to anything in the training there. And, and it's pretty darn good, right? And that's really new, right? For a long time, people were trying to, you know, even generate endless samples from uh, deep belief networks, and we we're struggling to just do that. And we couldn't really generate things that were plausible. And the interesting thing about this is that now we can generate images conditionally. So we can actually condition the variable upon which will, the image will be generated based on uh, you know, some, some factor. So that means that we have a possibility of uh, hallucinating possible outcomes in the perceptual domain. Um, the other side of this is the adversarial part. Right? So um, there are a lot of problems that don't really lend themselves to have a very crisp loss function. We used to really like just having a nice loss function to be able to do supervised learning. Right? So does this image look good? Right? Um, what was this interaction with this AI or this bot uh, pleasant? Is this text uh, topical for the topic of interest? Right? And all those questions that you might be asking uh, from a model end up being of the nature of you know it when you see it. You don't really have a distance measure towards the ground truth that you can really uh, measure effectively without introducing tons of biases. This, I, the idea there is that you might have a lot of data that looks like what you want, but you don't really know necessarily how to measure how close you are to this data manifold. So the solution that adversarial training uh, provides is, well, give me some data that looks like what you want, uh, 
I'll co-train a loss function which discriminates between the good stuff and what I produced. And then the less I can tell the difference between the two, the more progress I've made. Right? It's a very general concept. And it's very honest, right? You cannot really cheat because as soon as you cheat, the discriminator will pick up on the cheat and will adapt to it. So you, you really um, can um, focus your learning on, the th on uh, really trying to match the data manifold without taking any shortcuts, right? In, in supervised learning, you often have a proxy loss that's in incomplete, that doesn't represent the entire task, and in this case, you can really have a loss that really reflects um, the, the way the data is, uh, is distributed. Uh, it has a price, it's really hard to train those models, but that's, um, that's partially because they do a really difficult uh, task. So what does it have to do with robotics? Um, one thing that's really interesting about having these generative powers is that now you can actually generate sensor inputs for your robots. So you can actually manipulate reality in a, in a way in simulation, and that's very interesting. Um, we also used in robotics to have tasks that are really resistant to being expressed uh, using a simple loss function, right? Maybe you can define the goal, or maybe you can define the goal, but it's really hard to instrument the goal on a real robot. Or even if you can instrument it, you often have this case of you know, having a very flat loss function, it's zero everywhere, except when you hit the goal, and then it's really hard to go towards that goal. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the generative you know, what does it mean to have those generative superpowers now with some examples of research that have really tackled, used that, uh, those capabilities. And then I'll talk a bit about the adversarial aspects and how we can use those. So one, one of the very interesting early work, uh, recent, is the work from Chelsea, who's gonna be uh, speaking later, um, on uh, visual MPC, right? Um, the insight there was, uh, to use conditional image generation as a way to plan actions. Right? So the robot essentially visualizes what might happen if they do X, and based on the output pixels, decides on which uh, course of action to take. Um, so what it looks like is something like this. Uh, this is a video of a robot uh, pushing objects in a bin, and the, the video you know, it gets blurry over time, that's because the, 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 it's basically a prediction of the future, the conditional future based on doing a specific action. Um, the setting for the experiments was you have an object, you specify a point on the object and a point where you want that point to be moved, and the robot will generate conditional futures that match more closely uh, this, uh, the point uh, the, 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 the perceptual output of uh, the, what the future will look like if they do this conditional action, and then you can servo based on uh, this predicted output towards the goal. And for very short-term uh, uh, motion, it actually works pretty well, right? It probably won't extend very easily to very complex multimodal things because we don't yet know how to generate conditionally those things. But for very short-term uh, applications, it actually works uh, very nicely. Another uh, thing that's interesting from the perspective of generating uh, data is the ability to close the reality gap between simulation and the real world. Right, so um, we, there are a lot of things that you can do in a simulator that you cannot do in a real world, and usually transferring that to a real robot is a really hard problem. But now we can actually take the outputs of a simulator and say, well, what would it look like in the real world just by base, based on giving it a lot of real world data and training again that basically maps one to the other. Um, so this work is about pixel level domain adaptation. It's basically essentially a GAN with a little bit of supervision on top that usually helps uh, stabilize GAN training to have a little bit of supervision. And the, 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 the image examples here are not very salient. It's uh, adapting MNISTs to be uh, in the domain of MNIST with some image backgrounds. Um, but the more interesting thing from a robotic standpoint is, for example, applying this to uh, pose estimation. Right, so getting ground truth for pose estimation in the real world is really hard 
you can do that very trivially in the 3D simulator. You have the perfect ground truth of what, what the pause is. Uh, you can render the images, and then the question is, you know, once you have this good pause estimator in the in, in the virtual domain, how can you use it in the real world, in particular when you have cluttered environment and lots of uh, and lots of noise around it. And so you can take those images that are rendered in, uh, in simulation and you can basically map them to the real world using a GAN and, uh, and, and then train on that data that looks very much like the, 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 the real data. And, and the results uh, stand up. They, they, it, it works remarkably well uh, for an image that, you know, for an input that really didn't have any sort of background or anything and was poorly rendered. The, the, the idea was not to try and make something very realistic to begin with. Um, another interesting thing is that it actually generalizes well. So the, the, the system that maps the simulated data to the real world data is not really object agnostic. It's really learning a generic mapping between the simulated uh, world and the real world that can extrapolate uh, very well. So, it really opens up new possibilities in terms of training uh, things in simulation and actually using them in the real world. So let's talk about adversarial uh, settings as well. Um, there are lots of problems in robotics where uh, we ask questions that um, are difficult to answer using a very simple metric. So for example, what is a stable grasp, right? A, the answer of grasp being stable is, well, if I grasp something and if I move it around, it doesn't fall, then it's stable. You can try to reverse engineer a mathematical formulation from that, but really the real test would be, can you actually do that uh, you know, on the real robot? Can you really perturb bait the robot and, uh, and, and, uh, and it will actually uh, remain stable? So why not do that in, uh, in training, right? If that's the way we evaluate things, can we do that in, um, at, tra at training time and get a better outcome because we're matching the training to the testing? So here is an example, for example, where, um, did I skip one? No. Um, the, the previous one was trying to shake something out of a grasp. Here is an example of trying to snatch something out of a grasp. So this, um, this work is work uh, mostly from CMU in collaboration with uh, one of my colleagues, James, who's in the back. Um, and they basically trained a, a, a grasping setup to with in the loop in uh, at training time, this notion of having an adversary that's adaptive, that actually tries to snatch things away or shake things away from the grasp. And you get better results and, uh, by just doing this. And you know, the stable grasp problem has always been a, a very complicated thing to define. There's been a lot of heuristics applied to it. But going directly with an adversarial setup seems to uh, be doing very well. Same thing for control, right? So how would you evaluate a robust controller? Well, you, if you're uh, Boston Dynamics, you're gonna kick your robot and, and uh, see if it stays up. Uh, I, can you do that in training? Can you actually optimize directly for that instead of just evaluating your things uh, at test time? So the, in this work, um, the an adaptive adversary is being used to, at training time, to uh, guide the learning and to speed up the, uh, the, the reinforcement learning. The idea is that you have your agent that's being trained. At the same time, you have an antagonist that's trying to, that's being trained, that tries to do basically the opposite of what the protagonist is doing and interacts with the environment in a closed loop. And it works well. So that's also work um, mostly at CMU in collaboration with some of my colleagues. Um, you get uh, reinforcement learning policies that are more stable, that are better, and that are more data efficient uh, just by adding this kind of adversarial setup. So 
note that of the, in the few things that I've discussed so far, uh, there was no GANs, right? There is an adversarial setup, but it wasn't an explicitly like a generative adversarial uh, model. And there are lots of ways you can define uh, adversarial setups that don't involve GANs. Right? In, in fact, the, the, the sort of uh, grandfather of GANs uh, in, in some ways uh, could be seen as the setup with a triplet loss and, um, and hard negative mining. And, and the, the, the connections are not uh, super obvious in, in, at, at first glance, but there's this idea of having a loss that's adaptive during training time um, that was there for a long time and that was uh, not necessarily explicit in the way of training. So the, 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 the way uh, triplet loss works is you have a notion of similarity between things and you have things that are uh, not similar perceptually but are similar semantically and things that are similar perceptually but not similar semantically. Did I say the same thing twice? Well, possibly. But you get my point. Um, so the idea of trade plate loss is you have an anchor and a negative image or a negative entity that you uh, want to push away from the anchor. You have a positive entity that you want to bring closer to the anchor. And uh, you have a loss that uh, basically tries to enforce those constraints. And you can learn that. The idea to making it work in practice, uh, the key is to sample dynamically uh, negatives that are hard to discriminate from the positives. Right? You have this adaptive process called um, hard negative mining that really always tries to push the boundary closer. So if you compare it to a GAN, you have a GAN where you care about the generator, you're trying to get a good generator and you pit it against the discriminator. Well, this is kind of the opposite. Right? You have this sampler that generates images that are hard for the discriminator to learn. And what you care in this setting is the discriminator. It's, it's the, 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 the adversary that you care about um, uh, making it work better, making work better. So we're going to use that setup for uh, an interesting uh, scenario for unsupervised imitation learning. And um, so the triplet loss is, is, is nice because you did a very simple uh, notion of things being alike or things not being alike, right? So in this work, we're gonna have this um, like and not like be looking at images of actions and looking at images of actions where if an, an image are taken, is taken at the same time but from a different point of view, we're gonna, gonna consider it to be alike. If the image is taken at a different time from the same point of view, it's gonna be considered different. So I'll, I'll make that a little bit clearer um, right now. So this is the setup. You are trying to learn a representation of actions. So say, for example, you're pouring objects, uh, pouring liquids in, in a cup, okay? And the setup is gonna be, you have two cameras recording the event from two different locations. So the two cameras are synchronized. It's actually pretty easy. You just say, there's an off-the-shelf uh, software to do that, uh, synchronized perfectly. Um, And what we're going to do is learn from those different point of views a representation of the action space. So imagine that you have two video streams and you're going to say, okay, from those two different point of views, the two images that are synchronized in time are similar. They correspond to the same state in action space. And two images that are taken at a different time are different. And you can, train a, a model with a triplet loss on this using hard negative mining and, 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 all that, uh, and all that machinery to try and learn what an action looks like at a point in time. So there's, there's been a ton of uh, uh, work uh, in that space using temporal co coherency as a way of eliciting really meaningful representations in videos. Um, it's been used for video analysis a lot, but the, the question now is, can we use that to discover state, action states, and scene attributes um, based on their temporal state? So the data ends up looking like this, right? You have two different viewpoints of an action being performed. Um, it's really, I mean, in a sense, it's very crappy data, right? It's very noisy, the, the, there is no calibration, there are occlusions, uh, there is motion blur. Uh, it's, it's, you know, taken using a handheld camera. So there's really not much 
calibration going on, set up, it's very cheap. Uh, you only need training for 15 minutes, and uh, we have uh, five minutes for testing. So actually something that's very manageable from a practical standpoint. And it works. So this is, for example, a proxy task that uh, was used to evaluate how well the representation is doing by uh, sort of labeling events along the, the path. So is the container at an angle? Is the liquid flowing? Is the recipient full or, or not? And based on, th based on this representation that's being learned by the, the time contrastive network, um, those, uh, those properties are, are learned uh, pretty well. So another way of evaluating this is to just look at videos of uh, the nearest neighbors. So this is a new event that's happening uh, that's not seen in training. And then um, as you can see here, this is the, the sequence of nearest neighbor uh, video images that correspond to uh, the motion. And it's kind of interesting, right? So you have a different viewpoint, different cans, different kinds of liquids. I mean, there is a lot of things that are abstracted there uh, that are not part of the representation. So the representation really represents the movement and not the objects. Um, different glasses. Um, and it's not entirely perfect, but um, it mostly represents the motion uh, pretty well. Um, you can test how it's doing by looking at uh, a fake pouring where you pretend that you're pouring and it's not. And the nearest neighbors are always the, uh, also mostly of, uh, of uh, cans not pouring anything down. So you're not really overfitting to the liquid. So that's good, you're, you're actually uh, learning something that's a bit more generic than that. Um, you can also check that you're not overfitting to the hand uh, by faking a robot arm. Very bad fakery, but it works pretty well. And it's very similar to, um, to, to, to the action being performed. So that's kind of nice, right? I mean, 15 minutes of experience, no calibration, embeddings that are agnostic to lots of things that you don't care about. And it's a very generic way of doing action representation. So let's use this for imitation. How am I doing in time? Um, so the goal here is to be able to do uh, uh, p uh, pose estimation and imitation completely end to end, right? And using only su self-supervised uh, data. So we have a few things we can use to make uh, this kind of uh, mapping between the pause of a human and uh, the pause of a robot. Right, so we have these uh, time contrastive networks that map uh, human pauses or robot pauses to themselves. Right? So you can learn using a triplet loss either from an agent, a robot, or a human and uh, get a, a, an embedding that corresponds to uh, the, that space. You can, if you have a robot, then you can actually capture the internal uh, angles and joint angles. So you can learn a mapping between a robot and its internal joint angles by uh, just regressing. Right, regressing from the from the videos, um, you can also get in in a way the human joint angles by having a human try to imitate a robot and capturing the joints of the robot while the human is imitating it, and that's you know very loose, right? Obviously, the geometry of the human is different from the geometry of the robot. The correspondence is very noisy. Um, but if your goal is to have the robot imitate a human, having the human imitate the robot is actually kind of the matched to the task. So it's, it's a very, very reasonable thing to do. And you can put everything together, right? So you have uh, a, a deep network that matches, that maps images to this time contrastive embedding. You can use the encoder that you've learned for the joints angles to match this embedding to the joints, whether it's using self-supervision or human supervision, um, you can project them basically into the same space and learn something that goes all the way between a human and the robot imitating what the human is doing. And in practice, it works pretty nicely, so if you, 
um, let's see, if you just uh, have a robot uh, doing self-supervised learning, uh, you have something that works a little bit better than random, but not by much. If you had a, hu a human imitation in the loop, uh, that works a lot better. You do both, you get a tiny bit of improvement. But as soon as you do um, some time contrastive learning on top of this, suddenly things start working a lot better. And uh, in fact, if you look at this data point where there is no human imitation involved, right, it's just based on the robot imitating itself and a human or a robot uh, basically doing random uh, gestures and being uh, observed by uh, different cameras. You actually get a pretty good number uh, compared to actually having a human imitating a robot, which is more matched to the, to, to the actual task, right? But it's expensive and it takes, a, it takes a lot of effort. So if you learn those embeddings, you can actually uh, look at what they represent and they seem to do something reasonable. So you have, uh, you know, people pose like this with the robots doing similar things um, and you know hand extended from different viewpoints things like that so it's there is a fair amount of structure in there and this is what uh, it ends up looking like so you can have your robot basically simulate uh, free space motion uh, purely unsupervised without any labels uh, it's kind of fun to see what you know how things are interpreted instead of the the, the wrist versus the the you know the, with the given the very different geometry of the of the robot. Um, this is another one where you include flexing, and it, it's it, it's kind of funny because the the whole the, the robot has has only one arm, right? So you you really have a very very uh, very loose mapping between the, 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 the two positions. Uh, here is a case where there is a, uh, actually a failure at, uh, towards the end um, where oh, the robot can't actually lift the arm up. And it, it's just purely a problem of bad sampling. The robot, when it sampled its joint space in a self-supervised manner, we never actually had it uh, go all the way up. And so it doesn't have a representation of that space. It still does something very reasonable. It goes up and then it stops because it doesn't know uh, how to go higher up. So if you put everything together, you get something like that where the robot tries to imitate things pretty well. Hence demonstrating that Jeff Dean is actually a robot. All right, so this is just the beginning. I mean, there's a lot more to learn uh, in this space. I think uh, this is very promising. In particular, the question becomes then, can we use those kinds of approaches to learn more elaborate tasks uh, that are not just free space motion, but that involve uh, manipulating objects and, and having com you know complicated contact things? Um, the, the more general message that I had was that um, there are new things that we can do with generative and adversarial setups. Uh, thinking generatively is very interesting and very new, and there might be ways of using it to basically syn synthesize conditional universes and visualize in you know, the robot's mind what the future might look like and use that uh, as a way of uh, solving robotics problems. And then thinking adversarially is also very interesting because it enables you to um, express problems that don't necessarily lend themselves to good rewards. Right? It's things where you know it when you see it uh, is, is uh, the, the general gist of the kind of problems that uh, can be solved using a, an adversarial setup. Okay, and that's all. I'm happy to entertain questions. Uh, gazebo for your simulation or something that we don't have access <laughs> this to? This is bullets. 
This is all. This is all bullets. Bullet. Yeah. So you can use bullet physics within Gazebo, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think Gazebo still have a, as an old version of bullets in it, but okay. the uh, bullet is open source and everything is uh, all the development, the ongoing development of bullet is done in the open source, so you have access to everything. Cool. Thank you. Listen, uh, great talk. So, again, oh, not only what you're showing, but also a lot of the progress that's happening on the vision side. There are amazing things happening that you know no one would, would have thought. But if you look at on the motion, the control side, you have like rigid grasping and servoing a fully actuated system, which basically solves problems in industrial automation from decades ago. So, I wonder, are we just basically doing wonderful things on the vision side and putting a little bit of motion on the end just to? For demo purposes, or, or is the progress <laughs> more possible. balanced than it it's seems possible. to me? It's possible. Um, the the you know the, the the caveat is that if you are grasping just rigid bodies, or if you're grasping bodies that are uh, simple to model, either as a simulated model or as a live model, then you know the traditional optimization techniques uh, work, work extremely well. As soon as you have things that are Entirely, you know, soft bodies or objects that you've never seen before, or that where you have to actually generalize from your knowledge, then the question is more nuanced, right? It's not clear that we can do as good a job in control by just overfitting, right? That's how you, I call optimization: it's overfitting to the training data, as opposed to learning a model that's um, that has the capability to generalize to. Uh, things that are um, less, um, that are harder to, to to represent, and it's it's not clear, right? I, I don't I don't I don't have a good answer to that. I think the, it's it's important to explore both paths, but I don't know that which one will be uh, the more interesting. Okay. Uh, I was wondering, like some of the tasks, uh, do we need to, do we have to solve it in a machine learning way? Like, uh, if you want a robot to um, do the same gestures as uh, a human, can you just put uh, all those sensors on the uh, human so that uh, it's easier to make the robot do exactly what the person is doing? Yeah, if you have the ability to instrument a human to do something and then just regress from those those positions, if you have a perfect knowledge of what they're doing, yes. Um, you know, the interesting th setting is when you don't, right? When you actually have a robot in the real world and you want to tell the robot, you know, go do this. Uh, you don't want to have to suit up and uh, be in a mocap environment to be able to do that. You can only do that in the lab. Um, I think this is, you know, the end goal here is not achieved by just demonstrating that we can do free space motion imitation. That would be a very low bar to hit. I think the more interesting is, can we actually use this to do more complex tasks? And can we use this to bootstrap learning for other things? The, the actual bootstrap problem is a huge problem in, in, in learning in robotics, right? Being able to actually demonstrate a little bit of what the kind of things that you want and so that the learning machine can actually self uh, can actually uh, start learning faster. Um. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Vincent. Terrific. <clears throat>